Hello, I'm Andrew from Fastly. Uh, my talk today is about HTTP headers, which some of which I think are becoming incredibly powerful and offer us some new kind of superpowers for the web. Um, in the early days of the web, we would make requests and responses that look a bit like this. Very simple. I want this stuff. Server says, here you are. And actually, the only required header in the response is the date. But way back in the, in the beginnings of HTTP 1.1, um, even back then, you would get other headers. You would get content type, and you'd get content length, at least. Today, that response looks more like this. Where did we go wrong? <laughs> or maybe we didn't go wrong. Maybe all of these headers are really useful and exciting and um, you know, make the web uh, richer and more secure and faster than um, we were able to achieve before. I'm interested in this because I work for a CDN. Uh, Fastly routes around 10% of the internet's traffic. And so we have an interest in making sure that people are delivering their websites securely and uh, in the most performant way possible. I also spent the last two years as a member of the W3C's technical architecture group, uh, which is responsible for guiding the development of web architecture. Um, people who want to add things to the web platform, they come to us with their proposed specification. We have a design review. We give them feedback. Um, because this is a democratic process, they are then free to completely ignore us and do what they wanted to do anyway. Um, but sometimes they do take our feedback on board, and it's, it's quite rewarding to be able to see all the new stuff that's coming to the web. So a lot of those new things in the last couple of years have been headers. And so I wanted to put together a, a talk to uh, start to take some of these ideas to a wider audience. So things like alternative services, feature policy, origin policy, clear site data, certificate transparency, integrity, and signature are hopefully uh, headers that are new to you. And I hope to uh, you know, engender some excitement for some of these new ideas that are coming to HTTP. At the same time, I did some research with HTTP Archive to find uh, what's popular today. What headers do people use most commonly on their sites, and why? Um, HTTP Archive is a project started by Google. Every two weeks, it loads the top 500,000 most popular websites um, and makes around 50 million HTTP requests. It puts all of the resulting data into BigQuery. Uh, we saw yesterday uh, some clever things that you can do with BigQuery regarding GitHub's public data set. And this is just another public data set you can use to uh, interrogate uh, using BigQuery. So I did that, and I made a list of the most popular headers that are sent back from um, these requests uh, that uh, HTTP Archive makes every couple of weeks. And HTTP Archive uses a tool called Web Page Test, which automatically extracts certain response headers that it expects to be on responses, things like content type and content length. So I'm eliminating all of those, because those are kind of boring, and they're always there. Um, and looking at the others, like what, what other headers are popular? So I made a list of those and categorized them by the number of domains that are emitting those headers and whether they're currently supported by browsers or whether they're upcoming standards or whether they're now deprecated and should be removed. So there were some interesting results here. The most popular header that I found was X-Frame Options and um, also X-Content Type Options. Is a very, uh, it's very surprising that it's so popular. And I'm going to talk about both of those headers in a second. Um, the first one in this list that I didn't recognize myself was called P3P. Who's heard of P3P? Amazing. Like, that's one person like that. It's amazing. So P3P is emitted by almost 10% of um, the servers surveyed by HTTP Archive, which I found really surprising. It's only supported by one browser, and the most... <laughs> And the most common value for this header is, this is not a P3P policy. <laughs> so, <laughs> what's going on? Um, so there's a very interesting backstory to this. <laughs> this, stands, this. This header stands for Platform for Privacy Preferences Project, um, which is never a phrase I intended to say in a public forum, um, although I think I managed it. It's intended as a machine-readable declaration of privacy policy. So a site can provide, a, in a structured manner, 
data which a browser can then surface to the user in whatever way it chooses to express how that site is going to interact with their personal data. So it's not a bad idea, but it was never actually implemented by any browser in a way that surfaces the information to users. So given that whatever you put in this header is not going to actually make any difference to the user, they're not going to know what it is, um, it doesn't really matter what you write in it. But for the purposes of Internet Explorer, you have to set this header in order to get access to cookies in third-party iframes. So you can actually set it to whatever you like, and that then passes this validation test. Um, and in fact, there's an incentive not to set it to one of the, 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 the spec values, because if you did, you'd have to change that when the way you interact with user data changes to make sure it's always accurate. So setting it to this is not a P3P policy is actually a pretty pragmatic thing to do. Conclusion here, please don't use P3P and uh, just don't use third-party cookies and iframes. That's generally not a good idea anyway. Um, now, we're probably all familiar with a header called expires. This was standardized as part of HTTP 1.1 back in 1997, and it's submitted by 78% of the domains in the archive. So this is an incredibly popular header. Why am I concerned about this? It's supported by all browsers. Um, seems like a fairly straightforward header that does useful stuff. But the most popular value for this header is Thursday, 1st of December, 1994, <laughs> at 4 p.m., GMT. Anyone want to guess why this is the most popular value for this header? It's in the spec, yes. It's, a, it's an example from the spec. <laughs> Why would you pick this value? Well, so it makes sense if you want a value that's in the past, which indicates that your content has already expired. You may as well choose the example from the spec. Um, the other reason I think that people probably copy and paste it from the spec is because inexplicably, HTTP standard dates include the day of the week. So if you wanted to just make up a date off the top of your head, you'd have to know what day of the week it was <laughs> in order to correctly format the date. And because you can't you know, calculate that in your head, uh, it's easier just to copy the example from the spec. <laughs> Next to that example in the spec is this text. It says, note, if a response includes a cache control field with a max age directive, that directive overrides the expires field. So obviously, there will be no websites that emit both a cache control <laughs> header with a max age and also an expires header. Um, nothing like this, for example, which includes an expires header, a cache control header with every single possible directive they can think of, and also a pragma header, which is not even a response header anyway. It was defined as a request header and has kind of been co-opted into being a response header by people who really want to insist that this, this response is not cacheable. Um, and browsers have even started to implement pragma as a response header, even though it was never standardized as one. In reality, 64% of domains in HTTP archive set both a cache control header and an expires header. Um, so this is pretty terrible. And in reality, if you want your content to not be cached, this is all you have to do. Private says shared caches like Fastly won't cache the content, and we'll, we'll respect that. No cache says that the content is stale the moment it hits the browser. And must revalidate says you can't use stale content. So these are the only three directives you need to combine to make something not cacheable. And the, uh, the next one I want to look at is, uh, from the archive is xcache. And this is an example of a header which is meaningless. It's not supported by any browser. There's no spec that defines what it is. Um, there's no document that tells me what the values of this header are. And yet, it's sent by 13% of domains in the archive. Um, and they almost always set it to the word hit. So why is there this such common agreement on what xcache means, despite the fact that no one's ever written it down? And the answer is, uh, this one is our fault. Um, it's CDNs, because this header is typically not emitted by servers. It's added by CDNs on the way through to say whether this object was uh, read from the CDN cache or whether it was retrieved from the upstream server. And we really shouldn't be doing this. Um, it is useful for our customers to debug our services. Um, but it's not really useful for the end user, and in 99.9% .9 of cases, we're sending it to an end user. So it's in good company. Um, <laughs> I found about a million in, uh, unique headers in HTTP archive that are not part of any HTTP specification. And uh, they take various forms. Most of them are kind of debugging headers. 
Some of them are request headers like host and referrer that have been incorrectly echoed into the response, probably by misconfigured uh, servers. Some of them are vanity headers like server or generator or you know, X generated by or whatever. You know, advertising to end users what your server software is, is not particularly useful to anyone um, and is just bytes that go ahead of your content on the critical path. I would remove all of this information. Um, if you're using something like Varnish Cache, you can do this very easily. Just write a little bit of VCL that says, unless some kind of debug token is present, let's just remove all the headers that don't mean anything and don't do anything. And the final one, which came out of the Vista research, which I found interesting, was X-Frame Options. Um, this is a very popular header, and it's very uh, narrowly defined. It does one single, very singular thing, which is to prevent your site being framed by another site. And this is generally a reasonably good idea. It's supported by all the browsers. The problem with it is that there is actually just a better way of doing it. So instead of saying X frame options same origin, it's better to do a content security policy of frame ancestors self. The reason this is better is that content security policy has had a lot of work put into uh, specifying it in a very uh, detailed way. So browsers tend to implement it in a very consistent manner, whereas X frame options same origin has less specification detail, and so the behavior of browsers is a bit less consistent. Um, particularly when it comes to, say, your site, a site that sets X frame options same origin is framed by another page on the same origin, so that's okay, but that page doesn't serve X frame options same origin, and that is then framed by another site that is from a foreign origin. What do you do in that situation? So, you know, there's, these kind of edge cases are much better specified and much more consistently implemented by content security policy. And you should, of course, have a content security policy anyway, and we'll come on to that in a, min in a minute. So these are the headers that maybe you should reconsider. What are the headers that you should definitely be setting? Uh, I'm going to break these down into three categories. There's resource integrity and validation. These are the headers that help to um, add trust to the content of the document. So the first one of these is integrity. And you'll now start to see the, the logos in the top right going gray a lot more because these are a lot of these headers I'm going to talk about are not yet supported by any browser. The threat model here is I go to some third party site and I am persuaded to add their clever widget to my website. Facebook like button, uh, Twitter thing, whatever or discuss, whatever it happens to be. I actually started a service called polyfill.io, which does exactly this, and is now being requested like five billion times a month by various, by like 10,000 websites. Now I could, I, I have push rights to that repo, I can edit that JavaScript, which means that let's say, you know, some airline that has some kind of dark pattern for convincing you to buy their insurance puts my polyfill library on their site, I can just fix that UI for you and remove their dark pattern. That's the power that I have as a third party over a website that decides to add my JavaScript to their site. And that's a bad thing, right? I should not be allowed to do that. So we can invented this thing called sub-resource integrity, which allows you to add a hash of the content on the third party server to your script tag. So once that JavaScript is downloaded, if it doesn't match the hash, it doesn't get passed. So that's kind of swinging completely 100% the other way. Now the third party can't even make a bug fix to their JavaScript without preventing it from executing your browser. So enter the new integrity header. We still use the integrity property of the script tag. Uh, we set it to a public key rather than a hash of the content. And then an integrity header will contain a base64 encoded signature uh, of uh, the, uh, the content um, created using this key pair. So the browser can now validate this signature against the public key in the um, script tag, and if it passes, evaluate the content. So now the owner of this key has the right to update this content, but no one else does. So for example, if this third party is using a CDN, the CDN is terminating TLS, so they're able to see the content in plain text, but they can't edit it because it would, val it would violate this integrity principle, and they don't have the key. Um, now, there's also a header, confusingly called signature, which is going through the standardization process, which is nothing to do with sub-resource integrity. Um, the signature header is part of a new spec called signed exchanges, the purpose of which is to tie a response to a particular origin. Now, normally, when you load, say, the New York Times in your browser, it'll say nytimes.com in your address bar, and there'll be a lock to say this is all TLS and verified and everything. Now, why is that? It's nothing about the content itself. 
The content doesn't say anything about its origin. It's the fact that the connection is verified and the content was loaded over that connection. Now let's say we were to load a New York Times article from a different connection, like say example.com were to serve a New York Times article. That, that content, the browser can't assert that that content belongs to the New York Times. So the signature method, the signature header allows that capability. So we can see a link to the New York Times, which actually in reality goes to example.com slash NYT. The response served by that server includes a signature header generated using the New York Times TLS certificate. And as a result, the browser is able to put nytimes.com in the address bar. Why on earth would you want to do this? Well, there are some platforms uh, that desire to take publishers' content and display it from a different origin. Um, and those platforms, such as Google's accelerated mobile pages being the most uh, well-known one, have this problem of having to display really terrible URLs. So you may have seen google.com slash amp slash nytimes.com slash blah, 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 blah. And this is an attempt to solve that problem. Because Google want to pre-render New York Times so that if they think you're about to hit the link, they'll pre-render the documents so they can load it instantly. But they consider that to be a breach of your privacy to load it from New York Times, because then the NYT would know that you were about to visit their site, and you haven't actually declared an intention to do that yet. So they want to load it from their own servers, but they want to be able to put nytimes.com in the address bar, and this is the solution to do that. So expect in the future platforms like Facebook and Google to ask you to sign your content using that method. So the next category is one-off action triggers. These are headers which cause the browser to do something useful but are not related to the content that they are attached to. This is somewhat controversial because the idea of headers is that they are metadata describing the document, right? And to just piggyback some kind of random instruction on that seems like misuse of the protocol. But nevertheless, we're seeing a lot more of this happen. And um, so I want to talk briefly about alternative services. Alternative services is a header that allows the browser to connect to an alternative server that might be better than the one that they initially connected to. So this is like a layer beyond DNS. We use DNS to resolve a name to a particular server. And DNS is pretty good at doing things like routing us to a server that's close to us. But alternative services might offer us slightly cleverer ways of routing to better um, options. So for example, if our server supports Quick, which is a brand new um, uh, evolved protocol that goes beyond HTTP, then uh, the browser can't assume that our server supports Quick because most servers don't support Quick. So it will connect over HTTP 1.1 over TCP IP. And the server can then return an alternative services header saying, well, actually, I support Quick. So next time, maybe think about using Quick, or at least in this case, for the next hour. So the user will connect to a server. The server will say, you know, actually, you're probably better off talking to this other server. And then for future requests, including images and style sheets and scripts for that page, we can fetch those from the other server. So this is useful for upgrading the web from um, the current generation of HTTP to Quick. So if you've started investigating Quick, as a way of speeding up your, uh, your sites, and you certainly should do if you haven't already. Um, alternative services will be involved in transitioning your users from the existing version of HTTP to Quick. Next, I want to talk about clear site data. Has anyone ever had that problem where you want to make an update to a library, um, but you accidentally set a TTL of a year on that file, and so now you've got a whole set of users for whom your website will only work if you manage to phone them up and tell them to clear their cache. Um, I used to work for the FT, and we used to use a technology called App Cache, which is the, the generation of offline technology that came before Service Worker. And App Cache would download and offline a set of resources for you in a very aggressive way. So the only way of updating those resources would be to issue a new App Cache manifest. But unfortunately, we, set, we, we issued a manifest with a TTL of three years on it. And there, as far as I'm aware, there are still users who still have that manifest and will never download those files, or at least until that manifest expires. This is a really big problem um, and something which is very hard to solve. I wrote a, an article about this in December 
for Perth Planet, looking at all the different ways that people try to clear their own files out of uh, their users' caches without having to phone them up and say, go to settings and then... So these are the methods, and there's quite a lot of, of innovative ways of doing this. And circled at the bottom, you see this new header, clear site data, and a row of no's, um, which demonstrates that this is not a useful technique yet, but it's getting there. And there is a prototype implementation in Chrome, which is currently disabled uh, due to a security review. But this is how it works. You would, in any response for anything, it could be an image, it could be a page, it could be a style sheet, anything you like, you just set this response header to say, I want to clear the cache for my domain. And it doesn't just clear that object out of the cache, it will nuke your entire origins cache. Um, and if you use the cache directive, that will clear the HTTP cache. Cookies will obviously clear cookies. Storage clears things like local storage and index DB. And the most interesting and exotic one, execution contacts, will kill all of your service workers and active tabs. Um, notice that these directives are in double quotes. This is a good example of how HTTP headers are incredibly inconsistent and badly specified in many ways. Um, the reason for this is apparently because in the future there might be uh, a change to JSON as a format for this header. And so therefore they want to be future compatible. I'm not entirely convinced by that. Things like cache control, for example, have established this principle that directives are not quoted. So having to quote this one seems like a massive foot gun to me. The final category I want to talk about is origin behaviors. So there are many HTTP headers that we include now on our pages that actually don't really relate to this one particular resource, but they relate to configuring behaviors for our entire website. So these are things like content security policy. Typically, you don't vary your content security policy from one page of your website to the next, um, but you return it in every single one of your responses, as you should do. Now, content security policy is well supported by all browsers, but it's only sent, sent by about 3% of websites. That's pretty terrible. Content security policy is a very important defense against cross-site scripting and injection attacks, uh, and you should definitely be doing it. One of the, the difficulties with CSP is they typically run very long. So an average length of a CSP header in HTTP archive is almost 600 bytes. An example of a typical one from, from the documentation, so I don't know how realistic this is in practice, is to say, by default, this page can only talk to itself, its own origin, um, but images can come from anywhere, and media and scripts can come from these whitelisted uh, uh, domains. And implementing a CSP like this will essentially set up a firewall in the browser. So you download the page from the, from the server, and then any requests that that page wants to make for images, style sheets, JavaScript, uh, AJAX requests, API requests, will all go through this CSP uh, firewall. So this creates a nice barrier if you have any kind of third-party script on your site that you don't want them to start reaching out to servers that you don't know about. Um, CSP can prevent that. But I said they were long. And the longest content security policy I've found in HTTP archive is this one, or at least this is a small part of it. Um, it's actually almost 10K in size. So an initial round trip that, uh, where you request a page and you get the first chunk of the response, that first chunk, because of various kind of the ways that TCP slow start and congestion windows and so on work, is going to be between 10 and 20 kilobytes. So if your headers take up all of that space, then in that first round trip, your user gets nothing painted on the screen. They're still looking at a white screen at this point. And you have to make another round trip to the origin server to get the, the next chunk, which will be the first chunk that includes any actual content that is actually paintable to the screen. So if you're, particularly if you're um, you know, in South Africa and you're trying to access a server that's in London, then it's probably a good idea to try and get some content into the first packet. <laughs> I think that's a good idea. <laughs> now, it surprised me that content security policy was not, as, not more widely adopted. And it's particularly surprising that it's, it's only a third as popular as expect certificate transparency, um, which is a header that very few people have heard of. But the reason that certificate transparency is so uh, popular is because Google have done their thing of attaching it to a massive great big stick and saying, we will beat you with this stick unless you add this header to your website. And the stick comes in the form of extended validation badging. So if your website has one of these fancy gold-plated extended validation TLS certificates, these are the certificates that result in your company name 
appearing in the address bar of the browser. Google now says, you cannot have this badge in the URL bar of the browser, even if you have an extended validation certificate, unless you enable certificate transparency on your site. Um, oops. So you do this just by using um, expect CT and you set it to a max age. In this case, uh, it's, it's a week. It's most commonly a week. And what this does is it tells the browser that if it receives a certificate that is unusual for this domain, it's a valid certificate, but it's one that is different to the typical one you receive for this domain, then report that to the domain owner. This means that whilst browsers are good at identifying invalid TLS certificates, they're not very good at identifying when a certificate authority has, has mistakenly issued a certificate for a domain. So browsers trust a lot of root certificate authorities, and those root certificate authorities could at any time issue a certificate for google.com or facebook.com if they wanted to, and browsers would trust that certificate. So certificate transparency is a way to allow those organizations to know that that's happened, or that a certificate authority has been compromised or persuaded to issue a certificate in error. Content type options is something I mentioned at the very beginning because it's actually one of the most popular, uh, popular headers that we see in the HTTP archive, and yet it does something incredibly niche. And I believe this is one of those headers that people add to their websites because they're told to by penetration test um, uh, companies that assess their website. Um, it's sent by about 20% of the uh, domains in the archive, and basically all it does is it says, that content type header that I set, I did actually mean that. Please don't you know, try and overrule me. And this is an attempt to prevent something called a mime confusion attack, where an attacker could upload something to your website using a feature you provide. Let's say you're a photo gallery, and you allow people to upload their own photos, and then you expose those photos back to them on a URL. So if I'm able to upload something that's not a photo, like say an HTML document or a JavaScript file, then I could convince your site's users to load that file and the browser might look at the file and think, well, it says it's an image, but it's clearly not an image, it's clearly a JavaScript. I'll just treat it as JavaScript, that will be good. Um, so the purpose of this header is to say, no, I actually really do mean this. If it's an invalid image, so be it, but please treat it as an image. The thing is, this is an incredibly niche um, attack surface these days. The fetch standard uh, has cleared up a lot of this kind of area and has now defined uh, destinations for every fetch. So when a browser makes a request to the network, we know what context we're making that request in. So if we just type a URL into the address bar and hit enter, the context for that fetch is navigation. It's a document destination. And content type options does not apply to document destinations. So setting this value will have no effect. In fact, it only has an effect for script and style destinations. So those are fetches initiated from script tags or link relic or style sheet. And even beyond that, Chrome and Firefox will refuse to do content sniffing if the server returns a content type header that begins with image, regardless of whether you set this header or not. So the attack surface here is browsers that are not Chrome or Firefox, where your server is either not emitting a content type header at all, or is emitting a malformed one or one that doesn't start with image. And you're loading the resource into a script tag or a style sheet. Pretty niche. Um, I've I've created a glitch here which demonstrates um, the situations in which setting this header makes a difference. And if you want to set it, it's pretty simple and it doesn't actually take up very much data. So I guess you kind of may as well if you don't, if you don't want to bother doing an assessment of whether this attack exists on your site. One header which definitely does uh, make a difference to every site is strict transport security. Um, and yet, this is sent by only half as many domains as, as use content type options. And basically, this just says, always connect to me over HTTPS. Because when people go to their browser and they type a web address in, they don't bother typing HTTPS colon slash slash CNN.com. They just type CNN.com. And the browser has to interpret that as meaning HTTP, not HTTPS. And so CNN will probably redirect you to HTTPS CNN.com. So first of all, that first request is insecure. So someone could intercept that and send you an invalid TLS certificate which uh, is signed for CNN.com and which uh, will convince you that you're now viewing CNN.com when actually you're, you've already been captured by a man in the middle. 
Um, the second thing is it's slow. You know, you have to suffer that redirect before you're then able to make a request to the proper server. So strict transport security is a great idea for every website, and everyone should be doing it. Um, and it's extremely simple to set. You just set a max age. So now when I type in cnn.com, the browser knows it's not even going to bother trying HTTP. It will go straight to HTTPS. Referrer policy is slightly different to some of these other security headers in that rather than trying to secure your own website, this is about trying to avoid leaking data to other websites. So since the very beginning of the web, we've had the referrer header. In fact, we've been misspelling the referrer header. Um, and this is still the case today. Fortunately, referrer policy is correctly spelled. Um, and it determines how much of the URL to include in the referrer header. So if you don't emit um, one of these headers, then the default will be no referrer when downgrade, which will include the full URL in the referrer header, unless you are linking from a secure site to an insecure site. And that's now the browser default. But I recommend the policy origin when cross origin, which will include the full URL when you're linking to your own site, your own domain, and it will include only the domain name when you're linking to a foreign domain. It's quite interesting to me that uh, they've decided in the spec to kind of package all of these options into a number of named uh, buckets, rather than saying you can set the policy for same origin separately to the policy for foreign origin. And there's also variations for if you're linking from a secure site to an insecure site. Um, but these have all been packed together into you know, seven discrete options. Um, so of those options, I recommend origin when cross-origin. All of these headers that I've gone through so far in this section are covered by securityheaders.io, uh, which is an audit tool, nothing to do with me, but I, I think it, it is a really quick and easy way to audit your own site. So if you just pop your domain in here, it will give you a grade and it will take you through a lot of these headers and tell you how you can use them. I don't necessarily agree with all of the recommendations it makes, but it doesn't go far wrong and I think um, if you were to follow all of its instructions, your site would definitely be more secure. Now on to performance. And who's heard of client hints? Can I see a show of hands of people who've heard of client hints? Wow, like three, amazing. Um, so client hints is a brand new specification that allows you to request properties of devices. So you can say, uh, I, will, I'm, I have variations of this image that I can serve to you depending on whether you have a high density screen, um, whether your device has a huge screen or a really small one. And rather than having to do all of those assessments in JavaScript and then uh, making, a, you know, uh, a, a, making an amendment to the URL of the image, you can just get the browser to send all this information in headers. And this is a really efficient way of doing it from a caching perspective, because intermediary caches like Fastly can now, can now cache all of the different variations of those images um, very efficiently. So this is how this works. In any response that you serve to the user, so this, let's say someone goes to your website and loads the HTML page. In the HTML page response, you include this response header that says accept CH and then lists all the device properties you want to know. So you're like, I'd like to know what your device pixel ratio is. I'd like to know what the width of your device is. And I'd like to know how wide your window is. And also I'd like to know whether you've enabled data saving mode. And please continue to send me that information for the next day even if I don't request it again. So then on subsequent requests, including requests for images, scripts, and styles for that same page, the browser will send you some additional headers. It will tell you the DPR, the width, the viewport width, and it will do a one or a zero for saved data. So this is super useful. This allows you to tune your responses to the needs and capabilities of individual devices, and particularly saved data, which is supposed to be very aggressive. Like if I set saved data, I really want you to squash down the bytes as small as possible. The big problem with this is it's not sent in the first request. So that very first request for your, your website will not include any of this data. So um, the intention is that you use the client hints for resources, use it for images and scripts. So you don't actually use it to vary the HTML. But if you were to use it to vary the HTML, like to send a much smaller page, um, you can't do that for the first page. I think that's a shame. Now, a performance header that's been in wide circulation for a long time is the link preload header. And this allows servers to send um, instructions to browsers to, to get preloading documents, sorry, get preloading resources like scripts, styles, fonts, before the browser would otherwise do so. Um, it's, 
uh, very easy to invoke. You just add some link headers that say, this is my font, this is my style sheet. Please start loading these as quickly as possible. Um, because this addresses this problem that we're all completely fed up with, where you go to a website and the website is white for you know, 30 seconds because the font hasn't loaded yet. And you, know, you feel like, I could probably do with reading this website in the wrong font. I would survive. Um, and it would be better than me sitting here glaring at this blank screen um, whilst the, uh, the publisher loads their perfect typography. So this helps to load the font faster. Uh, Adi Osmani from Google did a case study on Perf Calendar um, this, year, uh, this past year uh, of Tinder, who added this to their site. So you can see at the top, we load the, um, the HTML after about 200 milliseconds. And then it's not until about a second into the page load that we, um, we know that we need to load leanplum.js. No idea what that does, but um, apparently we need it for Tinder.com. And then after we add these link headers, all of those scripts start downloading at the same time. So Lean Plum arrives a lot faster than it would have done before. But there's still a problem here. And a lot of people already do this, but they still encounter this performance bottleneck, which is that, oh, sorry, I added this slide very late. Um, if you're interested in, in getting more information on the link header, my colleague Patrick Haman dives into this in great detail in a talk called CSS and the First Meaningful Paint. Um, if you're interested in that, do take a, a quick snap of that screen and you can, uh, you can learn more than you'll ever possibly want to know about preloading resources. But the problem with the link header still is that uh, we can't send headers until we've sent a status code. We have to conclude what the, what the basic result is from your request. Is it, is it OK? Is it a 404 not found? Um, is it like 403 forbidden? We need to know that before we can send you any headers. And so typically, this means we have to do lots of stuff. Database, authentication, templating, API queries, talk to a load of microservices, and then eventually conclude that, yeah, OK, this is a valid request, and we have a page for this, and here it is. And then we can send a status code 200 OK. And it's at that point that the browser can start preloading all of your resources. This sounds stupid to us, so at Fastly, we put together a new spec proposal called Early Hints. Um, and the idea of Early Hints is that we can send two status codes. The first one will be 103 Early Hints, and that will allow us to send a load of headers. And then later, we can send a second status code, uh, which is the actual status code, and then we repeat the same headers again, if they're still valid. So this allows the browser to start downloading those resources much earlier, while the server is still in its think time, and then when it's finally concluded whether this request is going to be a, a success or not, it can send a second status code. Um, this requires quite a bit of uh, rework of the way servers work and the way that CDNs work. And so we don't expect to see this this year. But we might start to see people adopting this next year. Two things left to talk about. And they're the most exciting um, developments to HTTP of all. The first one is feature policy which has just started to be implemented in Chrome. Now imagine you could set a single header and turn off any behavior with the browser that you don't like. No more autoplaying videos. Autoplay, none. Video autoplay no longer exists as a feature on the web on your web page. Speaker self, now the only thing on your page that can emit audio is your own content. Any third party content that tries to play audio just won't work. This is pretty amazing. And it opens up the possibility to do all kinds of new stuff, um, which depends upon breaking previous features of the web. And it also gives us the ability to fix all the mistakes that we made in specifying earlier standards that are now not really a very good idea. Uh, Google is currently working on defining a, a feature policy called unsized media, which describes the ability of images to automatically size their content. So, Websites that kind of go as they're loading, because the images don't have widths and heights, wouldn't do that unless they opted uh, to enable the unsized media policy. If they disable unsized media, then those images will just be 0, 0, because they don't have a width and height set. So by disabling unsized media, we can get rid of that, that janky page load once and for all. And we can get really exotic with this. Imagine doc write none. Just turn off document.write. And then 
you know, we can make document.write go the way of Flash. You just simply can't use it anymore. So, so you know, advertisers are just going to have to deal with that. Um, or sync XHR, you know, synchronous XML HTTP requests still persists as a mechanism for beaconing analytics back on page unload. Um, we can get rid of that just by setting a simple peach feature policy. So this is like unbelievably exciting. <laughs> Um, please do read up on it. If you haven't heard of feature policy before, it might well change the way that you build websites in the future. Um, potential use cases. Maybe search engines could give you ranking bonuses if you enable certain feature policies. If you said, for example, disable document or write, or if you said, my website can be painted in one single pass and it doesn't require like re, re, uh, re, more style evaluation and, and more painting then they could say, okay, well, we'll pre-render the site because it's so cheap to do. Um, even just yesterday, uh, very conveniently for this talk, Google announced that the ANP project is going to start moving to a standards-based approach in which content will qualify to go into that fancy top stories carousel even if it doesn't use AMP, if it has a feature policy and various other standards that they're working on. And this depends on lots of these new standards coming in, like web packaging, iframe promotion, which currently exists purely as a, as a, as a kind of ideation post by me on a, a forum and hasn't gone any further than that. So that's literally like the earliest possible state that a, a feature can be in. Um, but if this stuff happens, then adopting things like feature policy will get you that premium position in search. And the final thing is origin policy. Now you might be thinking about all these headers this is a lot of stuff. And actually, all you've done is convince me that we need to put a lot of guff in our HTTP responses. Um, because we went from this, which was kind of OK, to this, which is uh -huh. um, And wouldn't it be better if all the things that we put in our responses that actually apply to our entire website could go in some kind of website manifest configuration file thing? Um, or you could also call that an origin policy. Um, so if we take all those settings, things like content security policy, referral policy, strict transport security, and content type options, which we don't want to apply to any specific page, but we just want them to apply to every page on our site, we could put them in this JSON file and then just refer to the policy in the response. So that's what's happening in origin policy. And that's being driven by uh, Mike West at Google. Uh, he of the double quoted um, uh, directives in uh, clear site data. So you know, two sides. <laughs> Mike is a great guy, and he's, uh, he always takes the tag feedback so well. Um, so recapping over the, the headers that we've talked about today, feature policy is amazing. Please go and read about it if you don't know about it already. Content security policy, strict transport security, referral policy, and link have value to almost every site on the web. So if your site doesn't use them, it probably should, and you should probably look into what value you should be setting for your site. Alternative services, clear site data, and expect certificate transparency have utility in certain use cases. So if those use cases apply to your site, um, you should be using them. Integrity, signature, accept client hints, um, early hints, and origin policy don't exist today and don't do anything. But start thinking about them and the way that they might change the way that you build sites in the future. And don't be afraid to remove headers that have moved beyond their useful life. If your site is still emitting P3P, expires, uh, random headers that don't mean anything, or X-frame options, maybe consider whether you could tidy that up um, and remove stuff that doesn't actually do anything. Um, and if you want any other uh, headers to think about or you have any questions about any of those, feel free to come and talk to me. Um, I can talk for hours about this, um, just as a word of warning. Thank you very much. <laughs>
either update their conception of what sane defaults are or to force you to actually specify explicitly which things you need? That's a good question, and I think the answer to that is to uh, see the, the incentives differently, uh, see the different incentives that exist. So as a framework author, I want to put an X powered by my awesome framework response header in all of your pages, because then I can go to HTTP archive and prove that loads of people are using my framework. Um, whereas you, as a site author, may not want people to know that I'm using your, I'm, you're using my framework because you know maybe my framework has a vulnerability in it, and people use that as a way to target that uh, those sites, uh, or or you just want to remove the the craft basically. Um, so I would not say it's a responsibility for framework authors to not advertise their their framework in the response headers, and also you know other headers like uh, CSP, they won't know what the correct values of those are for your particular case. So. I think it's kind of beyond the scope of frameworks to, to do this for you. Um, they can certainly help if they care uh, enough to you know, make it something that they put, like bring to your attention. Um, so I think the extent to which they do that is kind of something that they, they would take a view on. Thanks for that talk, it was super interesting. Um, the signature header, how, does it, how do you stop phishing sites from pretending to be legitimate sites? So this is the uh, sign exchanges that uh, allow you to download a page from one domain and pretend to be from another domain. Uh, the signature header is only valid if signed by the holder of the TLS cert for that origin. So I couldn't pretend to be Google.com because I don't have Google.com's private keys. Okay. And, and just another quick one, the um, interaction between STS and the alternative services header, uh, is there sort of an order of preference? How do you stop alternative services from introducing a non-HSTS path so that somebody hits it over port. So alternative services is not a, it's not a redirect. It's not mandatory. So you're just telling the browser, here is another endpoint that you could connect to if you want to. And then browsers will take a view on whether they want to do that or not. So if uh, you're already connected to an HTTPS over um, HTTP 1.1 um, and an alternative services header advertises an insecure HTTP endpoint, then you just won't use it. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> so I'm just wondering if there is a place where, you know, I don't know if there are many browser builders yet, but where, where can the rest of us go and lobby for, for some of the things that we see? Um, you know, can we go and add a vote somewhere? That's a good question. So the, the slides that, uh, I put up today, every one that introduces a new header has the link to the spec on the, the slide. So if you go through the slides, you can pick out the ones you're interested in and go see the spec. The top part of the spec, there's a standard format for web specs, and the top part of the spec will always include a link to the bug tracker uh, where you can go and raise the issue that you have. Um, sometimes there'll be a link to a forum as well. If, you're, if you feel like you're not confident enough to actually raise an issue, you could just open a, a thread in the forum. Um, and some of them have forums and some of them don't. Also, there's um, YCG, which is the Web Incubator Community Group, and that's designed to be a forum for um, uh, developers who are not spec people to just go and talk about specs. And um, that's a very accessible, very welcoming group. And you can talk about any spec in there. It doesn't have to be a WICG spec. I can hear you, I think. A question on the integrity header. Um, presumably, if the signature doesn't match, it will just fail. Um, isn't it simpler and just more reliable if I, if I don't trust the third party, just grab a copy of the widget and save it off my own site? I didn't hear that, sorry. <laughs> oh, OK, I'll try again. Um, the integrity header. Um, Presumably, if the signature doesn't match, uh, it will just break and the browser will give me some kind of error. Uh, wouldn't it be simpler if I just uh, include a copy of the third-party widget on my own site and... Oh, you mean just self-host the file? Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. And if you were using the current version of sub-resource integrity, um, then there really is no benefit to retrieving the file from the third party because the third party is just unable to edit it. Um, I guess just 
costs. You know, if you didn't want to transfer that data yourself, you can delegate it to the third party if they're willing to take that bandwidth for you. Um, but there are very few benefits. With the new standard, the third party can pu push bug fixes and changes into the file. So, you, so then the advantage is that you are opting into automatic updates. And you wouldn't get that if you self-hosted. Cool, last yes. question. Uh, re regarding the certificate transparency, which um, is there to, to find dodgy certificates, how does the browser tell the, um, the certificate owner that there's something dodgy going on? You know what? I don't know. I haven't actually. I haven't. Checked, haven't looked into that. Um, a lot of these. A lot of these headers have a report URL, um, which is a directive that's part of the header spec. So, for example, with content security policy, you can choose to report violations of the content security policy to a specific endpoint, and you include a directive with a URL where the report should be sent. I don't know whether it's the same mechanism for expect CT. Thanks. Okay. Cool.